Okay, with that, I just want to thank everybody again for coming up and finishing the last two panels and appreciate your, your time and efforts on that regard. And to the rest of you, that's it. We're not going to be drumming out the elements to you anymore. As I listen to them, though, you know, I'm constantly reminded of things that we talked about in the group, as I know most of the committee members are. But clearly here, I hope that we can communicate to you the point that it's really, you know, the, the whole is greater than just the sum of its parts. I think this, one of the things with the RP is it's not like you go in and cherry pick and say, I just want to do this, right? I think it is the, uh, the totality of the thing and how it continues to drive improvement over time. That's really important. So with that, if you can, I'm going to invite our, the, our invited execs up. We have Craig Pearson from Marathon, Ron McLean from Kinder Morgan, Andy Drake from Spectra, and uh, our good friend and committee uh, member, Nick Stavropoulos from PG&E. I'll bring their cards up here in a second. Um, what we've asked them to do, each of them is fairly familiar with this document. Ron is probably more familiar than he ever wanted to be with it, but because he had to put up with us for about a year and a half so far. But uh, I think that they've all intimately familiar with you and kind of give you a feel for What's it like when we try it on as a company? Is it realistic or not? So, Ron, I think in deference to your position as the chair, we'd like to start with you, if you don't mind. We'll just run our way down there. Thank you, sir. Wait for him to get the, uh, my slide deck up. But, you know, I would start with saying, you know, this, this document is by design a framework. And for it to be scalable, and flexible for people who have systems and for people who don't. It's, it's a little bit abstract. There's a lot of philosophy in it. And so by design, the committee tried to talk about what to do, not how to do it. And so I think what you'll hear from me and from the other members of the panel is how we've approached it. So this is a little bit of, of how, and it's just an example. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just jump off into it. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about scalability. Uh, small operators were concerned. They might not have the resources to work on this. And, and the committee actually had members from very small to very large uh, participants. I think Kinder Morgan is probably in the very large community. Uh, we operate about 82,000 miles of pipeline, 180 terminals. Uh, we have operations in Canada and Mexico, and uh, we actually now have five Jones Act vessels moving product around. So a little bit of everything. And so I'm, I'm going to talk through how Kinder Morgan has approached this and also the benefits that we've seen from it. And uh, so our efforts uh, are... Uh, we. Let me first just start with what our document looks like. I've actually pulled a few pages and put on the right-hand side of this because when you start thinking through what does it take to implement this, uh, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be bound. It's not volumes of data because it's going to build on policies, procedures, and other things that you already have. So you're your operations, and we call it an operations management system, but it really is a pipeline safety management system, it it's becomes the overarching policy for all the volumes of books and policies and procedures and construction standards that we have. Now, as I went back, I mean, Kinder Morgan, very large. We have five business seg segments that operate within Kinder Morgan. There's uh, natural gas. There's the uh, product pipelines that I preside over. We have a terminals business unit that doesn't have much in the way of, of pipeline, but a lot of terminals. We have a CO2 unit that's involved in a lot of production. And then we have a Canadian unit. So our OMS policy over the corporate version arches over all five of those business segments. And then each business segment has to figure out, what does that mean to me? How do I implement that? How do my policies meet the requirements of this overarching policy? And I'm just going to show you for a second. I mean, as you think about implementing this thing, this is our OMS. And it's fairly thin. Now, it's front and back, and it's a lot in here to do, but it's kind of formatted 
as you see this on the side. And so it's not necessarily flashy, but it, it really serves the purpose. And uh, it starts off with objectives, policy, and approach. And you know, it, the objectives, integrate operations, engineering, maintenance, ESH, asset integrity, efficiency, quality, and expansion into a single management system. Again, it takes off with that overarching viewpoint of all the other policies that almost every operator already has. Uh, achieve an appropriate level of consistency across Kinder Morgan uh, business units. And that recognizes that it's not a one size fits all, even within Kinder Morgan with five business segments, it's not a one size fits all for, for other operators uh, with different scales. Uh, so uh, consolidate and clarify. Uh, Increase confidence that each of Kinder Morgan's operations are consistent with other Kinder Morgan standards and in compliance with laws, regulations, and permit requirements. I'll touch on that in a minute, but dropping down to the next section, you know, there's a set of goals defined in our implementation of the OMS. And uh, we have external stakeholders in this, and in the last bullet that at least I showed there, open and productive relationship with regulators and the public. So it doesn't tell you how to do it in the document, but you have to have processes that we touch on regularly. And then we talk about roles and responsibilities. Now sometimes it's hard to tell the office of the chairman what his role is, but we actually do that within our document. It starts off with the office of the chairman. And uh, he's to evaluate, and we have three people that make up the office of the chairman. Rich Kinder is the most senior, but evaluate the changes to the OMS. Incorporate operations goal setting and review of operations, annual, quarterly, monthly, and weekly reviews of each business unit. And, you know, you get back to talking about intentionality, routine. That's the way you do it is you have annual, quarterly, monthly, and it's not the same thing every time. Some things may not merit that much review, but candidly a lot of things do. You plan, do, check, act through these processes of annual, quarterly, monthly, and weekly. Uh, and then you have responsibilities, at least on this page that I included, uh, business unit management, you know, that gets down to my level where we have the five units. But as you keep falling through the roles and responsibilities, everyone's accountability is defined all the way down to employees. And even within this document, that employees can stop work when they feel it's not safe. You know, it's one of their accountabilities. It's not just something they can do. It's an expectation that employees stop work if it's not safe. Actually, it shouldn't be that disruptive. If it's safe, you ought to be able to quickly explain why it's safe and continue on. If you can't explain why it's safe, you ought to stop and think about it a little bit, right? But, but anyway, format-wise, we, we do roles and responsibilities. Uh, acting with intentionality is central to making the most important aspects of safety and continuous performance improvement. So uh, it is a bit of a broken record, but in the world of running uh, pipelines, there are a lot of distractions. Uh, you have multiple regulating bodies, and even sometimes their requirements are in conflict. And I'm not just talking federal, state, you can get down to municipalities, and those are burdensome work tasks sometimes. You have uh, financial requirements. I mean, if you're not financially healthy, you're probably not going to be healthy in a lot of other areas. So that's important too. So you, you, you build those processes in. But uh, what, what this is really about is not looking at your integrity and risk management when you have time or when it occurs to you. It's really about forcing it to happen. Now, we use scheduling systems, so uh, and, and people have different brand names for doing that, but our annual meetings and, and reviews are actually in a system, and you get reminders to do them. If you don't do them and close them back into the system, they start escalating until they get all the way to the office of the chairman, and then you'll do them. And so that's the way to have discipline is scheduling systems, email reminders, must close them, or they escalate in their notification uh, that things weren't done. Uh, and just one of the team meetings that I would outline that we have annually, at least annually, because we talk about these things a lot more often, pipeline integrity. My integrity team with several members participating present to me how they've mitigated risk effectively 
across our pipeline system. And they're also required to tell me about things that aren't well mitigated. And it may be that there's a tool that's not available or it, it's, it can't be done for some reason. And we talk about it. How do we solve that? So that's forced to happen at least annually. Another thing that happens annually is we go through a pretty grueling budget process. And before the role I'm in now, I was a VP of Ops and Engineering. And at the end of every budget cycle, I had to certify that I have adequate funding and resources to be 100% compliance and manage risk. And if I don't agree to that at the end of the process, we start over and do it again. Now, now those are not earth-shaking things to do, but to do them with intentionality regularly, and for us, it's at least annually, it drives a lot of change within your company. And I can't say, well, I didn't have enough money or I didn't have enough resources. It's, it was my job in that role to make sure I had those. And in fact, the OMS requires that certification every year from the ops and engineering guys. Uh, scheduling system, I've already uh, touched on that. If not completed by the due date, alerts are provided to escalating management levels until the task is done and then it's documented. And then we have an audit and assessment team that reports to the office of the chairman. Uh, we audit at several levels uh, and, uh, and we generally do it internally. We don't use external auditors unless there was a special purpose. But these auditors within Kinder Morgan it, were large enough to have autonomous people out there who can do a cold eye review and uh, they audit one that we have implemented and complied with the operations management system and if you remember that overarches all of our procedures and then we audit locations that they comply with the procedures and, and if they don't that escalates up into a tracking system that if not closed within six months, that goes to the office of the chairman. So you, you can see it is kind of that plan, do, check, act, kind of continuous over and over to make sure that we're doing what, we're, what we said we do. In fact, audits, I don't view them as a negative because otherwise you're kind of flying blind at very senior management levels. So if you can imagine that all of us think something is happening, right? And if it's not happening, an audit is the way you know it's not happening or you confirm it is happening. So that's, that's kind of a feedback loop is I want an audit to tell me that what I think is happening is really happening. So it's, it's not a bad thing. It's certainly required in the OMS. Uh, this is a trend line I used briefly in our last workshop, but this is a chance to kind of talk about it a little bit. Uh, I actually spent 30 years on our natural gas assets. Uh, before coming over to the liquid and product lines. And in about 2005, uh, we were struggling. And what this graph shows is the blue line are incidents per year there on this graph. And the kind of the maroon or magenta line is volume released into the environment. And prior to 2005, in particular 2003, four, and five, we were on a pretty rocky road. I had lots of chats with Stacy and with Jeff and, and uh, Ted Wilkie and others, and it wasn't very pleasant. We spent a fortune on pipeline integrity. Uh, I thought it was a fortune, but we spent it because it was the right thing to do. And in fact, the system's pretty responsive to that. We drove volumes released, you know, you talk about leading indicators, a lot of incidents. We weren't having a lot of releases, but it was coming. But then our volumes dropped pretty low for as big a system as we operate. Incident rates were dropping. But in 2007 is when we really implemented our OMS process. And while you can spend a lot of money to fix problems, you can't make a trend of good performance without a system. I want to say that again. And if you cannot make a trend of year-over-year -year improvement without a system that you follow. And so that's, that's what we've done. And I want to be, you know, express a lot of humility on this. We've been very fortunate. A little bit lucky, but I also think you have to make your own luck in this business. And so we trend down consistently, lower and lower uh, incident numbers and lower and lower uh, release to where we virtually have no releases on the right of way. We uh, have some in facilities, that's a very difficult thing sometimes to get your hands around, 
facility releases generally don't affect the public in the same way, but uh, we're still trying to have zero facility releases. But on the right of way, we've been able to get our hands around that. Now we could have an incident tomorrow, but so I recognize how fragile success really is. But I still say a system lets you keep making those events more and more unlikely. I did want to touch on this one. Uh, we did have a propane release where a farmer hit our pipeline in 2011. And uh, I don't show it on our trend line. In honesty, I show it as a fairly large release of propane. It didn't affect the, the environment because it flashes into a vapor. There was no fire. There was no fatality. I've got some terrible pictures of a vapor cloud with a tractor in the middle of it. The vapor cloud's about 700 feet across. But a farmer hit our line. The line was over four feet deep. It was well marked. Public awareness was documented to contact, and he just chose not to, not to dial 811. And that's why I don't show it exactly on our trend line, because I just don't know what else we could have done in that situation. But he thought he had an exemption. In reality, there's no exemption for that depth of work. And I'll leave you with this thought on this, is always call 811. And uh, in this farmer's case, I sent him a pretty big bill for our emergency response on it. I hate, I hate to have that relationship with people, but it, it's, it's so important to, for the public to be engaged and all excavators in damage prevention. Uh, you know, I'll conclude that uh, I really believe the RP is practical and doable for all users. Large, small, it may take different resources. It may be more complicated for a large operator. Small operators may have to have a smaller or scaled down process to start with. We did a gap analysis of our OMS to this document. And our codes and standards team found about 65 things that they thought we should do having read the last draft, not the current draft that's being balloted. There were five areas they thought we were deficient in compared to the standard. And that included learning from external events. Now, we spent a lot of time analyzing things like the NTSB reports and other people's incidents in our own, but we weren't documenting that we did that. So we, we think we need to formalize that. Leading indicators. We need more leading indicators, and we need to require those in our OMS. Uh, there were three kind of related uh, under my bullet three there. Uh, we weren't necessarily documenting these input requirements, effectiveness and status of corrective actions from previous management reviews. We do them. We don't necessarily require that they be documented. Uh, the status of previously uh, identified corrective and preventive actions, we do track them. And we report on them occasionally, but the reviewer thought that we could do better in that area. And then the evaluation of pipeline safety system, uh, management system maturity. Uh, to do that, you've you got to have a scale you compare yourself to. And candidly for Kinder Morgan, that's something we've, gotta, we've got to work on to be able to say where, how mature are we in this process. So uh, I think that's... Uh, all of mine, but uh, I, I just close with saying I think it's very beneficial, I think it's, it's doable, and I think it's practical, and it's good business. And again, I say this with a lot of humility because we, it's so easy if you take your hands off these things, they'll go south on you. So it takes constant attention from all levels. Okay, thanks. Actually, I was neglectful in the beginning. I should have said that three of these four gentlemen, you know, I, I consider us lucky to have them on the our advisory committee. We have uh, two statutory advisory committees. Three of them are on there. The fourth is a personal friend and confidant, so I feel like I get the benefit of his knowledge as well. So maybe with that, we'll go to one of our other advisory committee members, Craig. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about our journey in Marathon Pipeline. Um, we in, uh, it, it kind of begins in year 2000 
Marathon, our, our parent, uh, decided that they were going to be certified by responsible care, all the operating components. Responsible care is a management system driven to minimize uh, environmental problems, and it's, it originated in the American Chemistry Council. Uh, long about in 2001, Marathon Pipeline, a subset of Marathon, uh, the organization in which I work in, uh, we implemented an operational excellence business model, and this was truly a transformational event for us. And what it, what it did, it, for, in our vernacular, set of management systems, we, we speak more about processes. And we started developing processes, uh, and we organized ourselves along process lines such that centrally, we figure out the work that needs to be done, how you do it, when you do it, who does it, and it gets executed decentrally. So it's centralized processes, decentralized execution. And that, that was uh, transformational for us, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, we implemented a management system in 2004, so here we are as we began this journey, we're uh, 12, 13, 14 years into it. And uh, it, it, I, I've become a disciple. I don't know that I'm an expert, but I am a disciple for sure. Uh, we, we achieved certification in 2009 as a responsible care company. That means you need to have a lot of the elements of the things that are in the, the pipeline safety management system. And in uh, 2011, uh, we began to implement process safety. That came from our refining component, and a lot of you are familiar with the process safety code from OSHA, and we began implementing that uh, company-wide. And in 2012, and this, I'll, I'll show you, I'll make some ties here, we implemented a strategic plan called Focus 2020, and the idea behind that branding was focus, obviously, focusing our energy in 2020 is, you know, it's got some out years vision, plus it has a, a measure of clarity of vision. But one of the other reasons for choosing the word focus is the act of focusing is, in and of itself, checking and adjusting. And we wanted, we wanted our people to understand that check and adjust is part of who we are. So, in uh, 2013, if you follow Responsible Care, they brought in a process safety code to bring in safety into uh, the Responsible Care code in addition to environmental protection. In 2014, it shows we're idle. We're far from idle. Uh, we have an initiative called uh, OE 2.0. I stole Jeff's term when he was labeling uh, IMP 2.0. OE 2.0 is is uh, taking, checking and adjusting on our operational excellence business model about 12 years later. I'll get into some of the details of that, but part of that check and adjust has been to watch how the industry is developing this safety management system, and we brought Stacy and Mark in to speak to our leadership so we can start getting a vision of where this is heading to make sure that our check and adjust can, uh, can bring in the features of the safety management system that we've been talking about. So getting to our strategic plan, I mentioned it, and, and we have two cultural documents, and this is one of them, and it's pretty simple. Uh, it, it gives our mission to our employees and our vision, and we've got five guiding principles, and we start getting more granular in these, and the reason this is important is that, that we start describing to ourselves who we are, what, what we want to be, what's important to us. This, this is, we're trying to capture our culture with these, and we only have two documents that we put up on everyone's wall. We try to keep them simple, and these are the two that, that everyone sees. I, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Uh, one of our guiding principles is leading safe performance, and we feel like it is part of our culture. It's part of our DNA that we view ourselves as guardians of public safety. And so we make specific mention of that. Under operational excellence, the bottom bullet that you'll see there is we use management systems to continuously improve. So Jeff brought us up here to talk about trying on safety management, safety management system. And I can tell you that we would be naked without it. It's part of who we are. It's part of our, it's part of our DNA. 
And lastly, I wasn't going to emphasize it, but it's, it's been interesting to see how it's been talked about engaged employees, and that is one of our guiding principles. We, we developed this document in 2011. We rolled it out in 12, and it's, it was kind of interesting to listen to all this and get some affirmation of some of the things that we think are important or being discussed. So management systems, uh, I'm a disciple, but I'm far from a subject matter expert, and it's, it's hard to get excited about talking about management systems. One of the things when we first started talking about this, we started talking about pro process and management systems, and I was clueless. What, what are the heck are we talking about? As, as I've come to watch it uh, play out, it's management systems that add the meat to plan, do, check, and adjust. All those, all those elements have three or four subdivisions within them. And one of the things that we've found is the hardest part is check and adjust. And the reason that that's been the hardest part is because you put so much effort in plan and do. Check and adjust takes its own effort. And, and sometimes we don't prioritize the resource to check and adjust because we want to get to the next plan and do. The reward, though, is sustainable, continuous improvement. And I, I think that we, we sometimes think about uh, time in terms of a year and five years. And in, in my mind, this is far too short. We're looking for sustainable improvement across generations. Uh, it is, it, things need to survive all of us as we move on. And you've got to have in place, you're not making the mistakes 20 years after you first made them. And I, I, I urge us to think in longer terms. How we tend to look at this is you're steadily trying to get this continuous improvement. And as you, as you develop new processes or improve your procedures, you got a backstop that keeps you from running, running back downhill. It's a slow, steady push uphill as you get these plan, do, check, and, and adjust processes. And, it's, and it, it, it's not fast and it's arduous. And sometimes it does run downhill, and you've just, you've just got to stay at it and keep trying to improve the check and adjust cycle. So as, we've been, as we started our journey now, I think we've got well over 300 processes. And you think about that, each one of those you need to have in a check and adjust cycle. It's a, it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of hard work, but if you don't, there's no way you're going to keep that from running back downhill. It's those, it's those processes and systems that that uh, keep, keep moving forward. As I looked at the, uh, the safety management system in its current draft, I, this is my, my personal comments, uh, I liked how safety culture was embedded throughout the, uh, throughout the document. I, I, it, it made more sense to me. It feels right. Uh, the, there is a lot of talk about leadership. And uh, it begins with the words of leadership, and it begins with those documents that we put in front of people, but it's defined by leadership actions. Your culture is defined by leadership actions. The, the smearing across everything, I like uh, the, the glue, Masood's uh, uh, glue analogy. Uh, we didn't collaborate on this, and I'm glad I don't operate in the state of Virginia. <laughs> the, the uh, one thing I will mention that from a safety culture perspective that it demands its own continuous improvement. Our businesses will change, technology will change, we'll have different business opportunities. And, and the safety culture that you've got, you always have to feel that that's vulnerable. You always, the, the notion of doing surveys, of checking and adjusting, it, it can erode and you constantly have this set of new people coming. If you develop a strategic plan in 2012, you better be talking about it to every employee every year and bringing into, bringing into every new employee needs to hear it. It's, it's a lot of work to keep that safety culture alive and well, but one of the things we found in our surveys that it is the single most prominent point of pride of our employees to work for a company that does business the right way and it does business safely. It, it is echoed repeatedly, even, even more than issues like compensation. So 
where do we go? How do we begin with this? And uh, we, our, our company hasn't been deeply involved in the development of the safety management system. We are uh, working on, okay, let's hit the ground running in 2015. And the, these are my thoughts. I think it begins with an assessment of gaps, and Ron had, has his own company assessing, and he, he revealed some of that. I, I, think, I think ultimately we need to have a gap assessment that has credibility, and with credibility, I think, I think of going outside the company. I'm not quite sure how to do that, but, but the gap assessment needs to have some consistency and some credibility, but I also believe strongly it needs not have a grade. We are not here to say good, good enough. It is all about continuous improvement. You're all the time focusing on what needs to be done. There will never be a shortage of, of things to improve upon. I, I urge us to avoid grading. So you identify gaps, you've got to hold yourself accountable to be closing gaps. And uh, Ron talked about systems in, in Kinder Morgan and all of us need to have those systems that hold us accountable to close gaps. In, as we look at the SMS and we look at ourselves, I think some of the areas for improvement that we've got are in metrics. And uh, we don't have uh, a, many leading metrics. And I think some of our older metrics uh, could be updated. It'll be watching with interest. I know FEMSA is looking at uh, newer, maybe more usable metrics. I think, I think we've got work to do there. We've got work to do in the continuous improvement cycle. And so we've got all these processes and we have process owners that help write these processes and develop them and keep them continuously improved, but we've not given them a lot of guidance on how to embed continuous improvement in their own processes. On stakeholder relations, we value it. We, we, we make a lot of effort to, uh, to, to engage like the Pipeline Safety Trust. We've learned an enormous amount listening to the Pipeline Safety Trust and their constituency. We've learned a lot about talking to our right-of-way residents about how, how to interact with them, what's important to them, but what we don't have, we don't have a management system that is driving that so that it survives the individuals that are now doing it. And, it, and there's, there, I think, stakeholder engagement. We've got documentation we need to do. And as soon as you start doing that documentation, you really start thinking about, now, what the heck is it that you want to be doing? And how do you want to do it? So we've got some undocumented practices that need to find their way into process number 398. So, closing, uh, API 1173, friend or fro, from, from, you probably got the message that from my perspective, it's absolutely a friend. I like how we're doing it now. I worry a little bit, uh, the more it moves towards regulation, I could think it could take on an unfriendly odor. And uh, I urge us to avoid that. I like how it is happening now, the collaboration uh, that we've got. Uh, the, the when will we see results, I'm, I, I'm a th th uh, stealer of Vince Lombardi's, if we chase perfection, we'll catch excellence. Uh, we will see results, and I think you'll see them, you'll see some short term, but it is obviously a long term effort. And choosing the right metrics, I, after watching us implement safety management systems in our country, in our company, and I watch others, there's no question that we're going to see progress, but we need to have patience. The, the question of when will we get there is clearly the wrong question. Uh, the, the, the right question is, what needs to be improved the most? You've, th that qualifier at the end is essential. What needs to be improved the most, and how quickly can we do it? How quickly can we get that check and adjust cycle working? Those are the right questions. So anyway, hope those comments are helpful, and thanks for being invited to provide them. I guess I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry, that was a cheap shot. You, you got it. Linda, at least she picked up. As a fellow regulator, she picked that one up. You know, and, and it was amazing. I was at the, I, I think Paul might have been there. We were at the uh, at last International Pipeline Conference, and this, this subject came up. We were just getting started, and I gave a presentation. And somebody in the audience, this was, you know, God knows, a year and a half, two years ago, stood up and said, yeah, well, when are you going to make it a regulation? And I said, why do we need to? 
I mean, if it's the right thing to do and it's a good thing to do, it's really a question of what the industry does with it. Why are we asked, starting with the question of when you're going to make it a regulation? We, I think you're hearing time and time again, good thing to do, right thing to do, provides you some flexibility, but you have to get after it. You have to do it. You know, if you don't do it, I think that's the direction where you start, people start pushing for regulation. Otherwise, I mean, embrace and take off with it, and I think we can get rid of that question. It's probably the least important of all of them. At any rate, with that sort of little tirade, Andy Drake from Spectra, a longtime member of our advisory committee and somebody who's been actually working with me for 15 years in risk management and all that. I know you didn't want to hear that, but it's true, along with our friend Stacy. So, Andy? Thanks, Jeff. It's ominous that we are now the old people that the young people talk about, you know, but. Uh, I don't know how that happened so quickly. Um, maybe if we can, oh, here. There we go. The obligatory system map, um, the, the key takeaway here, I think, is uh, obviously we're probably bigger than smaller as an operator goes. But I think the, the key takeaway to this on this map is really we have facilities, we have a, a significant presence in Canada and in the United States. We have liquid pipelines. And, oil pipe, or, and gas pipelines, just as Kinder Morgan does. And I think that affords us a very uh, comprehensive perspective sometimes. We get to see things from the U.S. side, regulatory developments and events going on here. We have a lot of conversations with the NEB and what they're trying to do. Uh, we have conversations with API. We have conversations with AGA. We have conversations with INGA. All those are amazingly uh, different perspectives sometimes, all pointed at a very common goal, and that is pipeline safety. And I think when we look at this journey uh, slide, it really shows, to me, I think the common thread we talked about earlier is zero is our common goal. It's the common thread in the platform that we all come together with, whether we're liquids, whether we're gas, distribution, transmission, north of the border, south of the border, regulator, operator, that doesn't matter. That is our common goal. It's a, it's a, it is possible. You know, we've had, when we introduced this concept many years ago, there was a, a, a huge backlash of, why the hell would you put that out there? It's not possible. You're just kind of baiting the bear. You're going to irritate everybody thinking that this can happen. It's like, it can happen. It's a mindset. And it's an incredible challenge. Can you embrace that challenge? And how much differently you might have to think to own that. And it sort of chucked a stick in everybody's spokes. And after they got up off the ground and they were a little grouchy, we had a little huddle and we talked through it. And I think there was, there was an, an incredible convergence around that concept and idea of what that might look like and what that might be. And I think what you're seeing here is a platform of continuous improvement already starting to evolve right in front of our very eyes. You know, when so many years ago, many, many years ago, <laughs> Uh, we, we were responding to incidents that were happening in the United States, and we developed the ASME B3188 standard on the, on the gas side, basically provided the foundation of technical thinking around integrity management. In that document, there were process elements, these amorphous thoughts about metrics and controls and quality systems and all these things people hated because it had no clear, tangible, executable. That's the beginning of this conversation. Those things came out of conversations with the chemical industry. They came out of conversations with the nuclear industry. These people have already you know, taken a step above us many years ago on management systems. And that was a starting point for us. I think as we look, you know, it's the RP to me is the next progression in clarifying and growing and evolving that thought and the thinking around how do we build on what we have and make that more tangible, more clear for people to embrace and to grab onto and practice. It doesn't replace them. It actually integrates them and complements them. We've seen this as an industry. I think the left side of that is pretty clear. The NEB is doing this. The U.S. regulators are doing this. The operators are doing this. This is happening. Uh, we've also seen it as a company. In our conversations north and south of the border, uh, we do get that benefit. 
uh, sometimes it seems a little bit like you're straddling the barbed wire fence, which can be a little intimidating, but the conversations north and the south of the border are actually very complementary to one another, and they're converging very quickly, which I think is very, very positive. And we get an opportunity, an opportunity, you know, uh, to, to grow from that. It seems not like an opportunity at the moment. It seems like a headache at the moment, but it's actually helping us to learn to grow. You know, the NAB just issued an incredibly good white paper on safety culture. If you haven't read it, I think it would be worthy of a link to those in the audience and on the webinar. Very, very powerful, very good thoughts on what is this to clarify this amorphous, slippery topic. Uh, but it is the glue. It is so key to what we're trying to do. To understand it is important. And I applaud the NEB for doing such an effort to, to clarify what they're thinking about, rather than just wielding these big words around, you know. Um, I think the elements that are comprised of the, R, the uh, this um, RP, they make sense. Someone said that earlier. It, it, uh, they're present in most companies. I mean, we have emergency response plans. We know we need to talk to the executives. We know we need to, we know we need to do these things. The thought here is, I think, it, it can sound like a bureaucratic effort when you look at the possible depth that this could go. And I know there's a lot of folks in the audience and on the webinar that this can be very intimidating. I would encourage you not to be overwhelmed or intimidated with where it could go and have it prevent you from starting, becoming more disciplined and structured around doing this. If you get started, it's amazing what all of a sudden you go, whoa, I didn't realize that. And that aha moment is worth the whole effort. That can save you incredible pain and agony and expense as an operator. And I think that's what the goal is here, is to get this more clear in front of people, more tangible in front of people, to start making it more intentional what you're looking at and how to embrace this and how to use it constructively. It's not intended to be accented on the syllable of writing big volumes in this incredible parasitic administrivia. That's, that's not the point. The point is to help you operate better. <laughs> Keep that as the focus and the goal and use it and start and wade into the water, toe, foot, leg, hips, you'll, you'll get in there and swim around and it'll make sense and you, you will drive the program's development. This just helps provide a little bit more clarity about what is, what are those ingredients? What are you trying to do with it? On Spectre Energy's OMS journey, we've been doing OMS systems for about 10 years, uh, north and south of the border. We developed an overarching OMS uh, framework. It's evolved quite a bit over time. Uh, our little lifesaver stick man there has become quite popular, uh, but he's now grown and gotten quite more sophisticated in how we do that. Uh, but it is really designed to help us as an intentional, deliberate check on the balance at set intervals and on defined issues. It's, it, to, to us, it fundamentally uses the materials, I think Ron mentioned that, it fundamentally uses so much of the materials we already have. We already have lots of procedures. We have roles and responsibilities. We have org charts. We have all these controls. They're all in there. This sort of sets over the top of it to kind of gut check them intentionally to see are they working as we would hope they would be and ask that question out loud. It really, to me, is, is sort of a QA process, and it's ongoing. I think in, the, in a lot of... Uh, in a lot of the U.S. in particular, in the Canada, it's called process. In the United States, it's not. It's called project, which changed words completely. Uh, we look at things as having a start and a stop, some finite element to it. It's a tangible, executable, and we're done, sort of like inoculation. I've done this. I'm good. I'm going to go forward. I'll be fine. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> That's going to wear off. It's not doing what you think it's going to do. The process part of this is hard for us to grasp onto because it never stops. At first, that's kind of frightening. But if you look at it as an opportunity rather than as this horrifying, never-ending obligation, I think it gives you a great opportunity to learn and grow. And I think it, to us, it helps us set structure and process to intentionally look at the elements that are key to our business success, which is fundamentally the operations of a pipeline. You know, it helps us strike a balance to protect and ensure that we are ahead of the issues that might happen. <laughs> the old adage, we want to happen to it before it happens to us on a very regular, ongoing basis. 
We always want to happen to it. We do not want it to happen to us. And I think that's our challenge. It helps us be on guard against a conspiracy of optimism, that we think that the things we've set in place are working so sure, but it's always a snake you don't see that bites you. It's the thing that you thought was working well that isn't, the thing you thought you knew for sure that was wrong. <laughs> Those are the, the things that come and get you, but if you never look for them, they'll just come and get you anyway. You just won't be ready for it. And that's what this is really designed to do. It is intended to be a complement to that process, to intentionally look back and see, are these things working for us? Are they doing what we'd like to think or what we intended to do? I said, old adage, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's a good part of this, I think. This is intended to check on the intentions, to make sure they're firing like they're supposed to. I think key to this also is, is to have the humility to recognize that we can improve and ferociously hunt down those opportunities. Not be afraid of them or find excuses or rationalizations or normalizations and reason why they're not. No, aggressively go find them and kill them. We did a gap assessment as well. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I think that the essence here is, um, you know, we, um, we philosophically on this are very aligned. I think this makes sense conceptually. It lines up with what we've been doing for so many years. I mean, there might have been a little bit of anxiety that we've done this so many years ago and this might be different and now the target's moved. No, it lines up fundamentally conceptually very, very well. I think uh, when we look at the gap assessment, I think we see some areas where we have some opportunities, some different categorization. I think you have, what, 14 elements. We had like 12 or 11. <laughs> okay, so we, call it tomato, you call it tomato, we gotta splice this a little bit different, that, that's fine, but the, I think the key pieces are still there. We did identify some things, I think some dimensions and areas where we can add to our plan and complement what we have uh, to improve what we're doing and our diligence around this. And, and um, in the end, in the scheme of a continuous improvement program, this fits right in. Wouldn't, wouldn't scary at all, it's actually awesome. <laughs> It's like all these people came together that we didn't have to pay to help us think about getting better. It was great. <laughs> um, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really that overwhelming, if, if particularly as you keep it in the scheme of this is a continuous improvement event. There's a gap, fine. Okay, well, we'll schedule it, keep in front of us, we'll look at it and plan dealing with the big things first and the next things next and the third things third and the fourth things fourth and on we go. Um, let's see. Final slide for me is, um, I think the safety culture discussion is, is very healthy. It's kind of intimidating because it is this amorphous sort of slippery thing. How are you going to regulate a culture? I don't know. I mean, that's kind of scary. But uh, uh, I think we, if you back up and look at, and this is kind of a little trail that Inga went down, was when we threw the zero challenge on the table, fundamentally we had to rethink the approach. So think about a process rather than a project. Think about dialing this in over time. There's no one single silver bullet or inoculation that's gonna help us get there. We're gonna have to keep regrouping, move back a couple feet, then take three more steps forward, move back a foot, three more steps forward. We're gonna have to keep willing to re-embrace and re-engage and re-engage over and over again. And I think the way it struck me as we looked at it is there's no one leg of the stool that's gonna win this. You're not gonna regulate your way out of this. But that doesn't mean you need no regulations. You need regulations and processes and culture and, and, and. It's, it's, this, col it's this collective um, culmination of all these elements, I think, that actually starts to set the culture and the tone around us. Um, and I think that is the glue, maybe, you're talking about. And I, and I like that thought. It's, um, I think the other thing that really struck me here is... Um, this humility issue, um, you know, um, it's kind of un, a little scary to stand up in front of people and say, I'm not perfect, you know, it seems like an odd thing, I think. Uh, but to have the courage to say, I'm not where I want to be, and I'm glad I recognize that because it gives me the opportunity to do better, than to wish I was and not be there and continue in existing in that gap. Because in that gap exists risk. 
And that's what we're really trying to come together. It's, it's more than who we want to be. We have to understand who we are and where is the space between what we want and what we're doing. And are we aggressively, intentionally looking to understand that and owning that possibility with a positive mindset of moving into that space? You know, I think this thing is designed to help us shift our focus from a very short-term tactical sh focus. It's very easy to get very distracted with all this work that has to be done. And you kind of get over here and you get over here and there's very rewarding because you're moving the ball along and you're doing things and you go home at the end of the day and you've accomplished, I've accomplished, I've accomplished, I've accomplished, I've accomplished. And then you look up and one degree every day over time and pretty soon you're not even harvesting your own field anymore. It's like, what are we doing way the hell over here? Well, we never looked up. <laughs> well, that would have been handy. Now we're way over here against a hard object we can't move. You know, and I think that's what this is trying to help us do is periodically look up, is what we're doing working for us? A long term complemented with the short term. And you're trying to strike an ex intentional explicit balance on that to help us stay on target to become who we want to be and accomplish the goals that we have set in front of ourselves that are very challenging, like zero. With that, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, reminds me of lots of things in prior discussions over the past decade and a half. And I remember in integrity management, when we were beginning integrity management, how the big bugaboo in the room was documentation. Oh, but did people hate documentation. But I think in the systems world, we've come to realize that if you can't describe it, you know, well enough to communicate it. You can't figure out when something goes wrong, what do I need to change? You know, you're documenting, communicating, hopefully achieving some consistency over time. And when things go wrong, it gives you a basis for improving. So it is sort of the necessary evil of life, and I know that you know that. Um, and then I was reminded on something else that you, you fired a neuron, and, and somebody had asked me this question at break. You know, I don't think anyone in, in the committee expects that when any of us would go to someone else's company, they would have an RP 1173 document up on a shelf, right? It, that's not the point, you know. The point was to us to gather up what we thought was a good system with good components and ask the companies to compare what they do with it, you know, and to the extent possible, as Andy demonstrated and the others as well, you know. What's the gap here? Where do we have an opportunity to improve? But no one's looking for an RP 1173 three ring binder on your shelf. Uh, I do think it's wise to have a, the gap analysis somewhere or say it calls for this. This is how we satisfy that. That's what we would call a bridge document. Um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll, I'll invite up to the last. Nick has had the opportunity to suffer through this past 18 months with us as well but as a member of the committee, so he, he and Ron have both been deeply steeped in this, but I've personally been very impressed with Nick's uh, approach to his job, and I know I've learned a lot from him. So with that, I'd like to welcome up Nick Savropoulos. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Um, as the last official speaker of the day, right, uh, I thought it might be, uh, a good opportunity for us to all reflect on why we have all been asked to come together to draft this document. Why did the NTSB ask API to bring together uh, multiple industries uh, and people from uh, all important elements of our, of, our, of our industry? The simple answer is they asked us to do this because it's all about saving lives. It's all about saving lives. You know, we talk about reducing incidents, getting to zero, but let's be straight. This is about saving lives and preventing serious environmental releases. Now, as an industry, we've made great progress, right? No one can deny that. 
When you really look at those trend lines, they're extremely positive. But if you were to go back and you were to look at the airline industry, you would have seen similar things. If you went back and you looked at the chemical industry before they embarked on their uh, 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 programs around process safety, you would have saw similar things. And aren't we glad, aren't we glad that they didn't rest on those laurels and say, hey, we've made great improvement. We're going to continue to make great improvement. Instead, what they did was they challenged themselves and they said, yeah, we've made great improvement. How can we do even better? And I think that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Because this is just not a program that we're trying to outline in this SMS, right? It's a way of life. It's the DNA within which we need to operate. We're, we have the good fortune of operating Diablo Nuclear Power Plant, uh, and uh, it continues to get uh, terrific safety ratings over a long period of time. That didn't happen by accident. That happened by intense focus with IMPO, metrics, safety management, process management systems, right? We've seen the chemical industry make massive improvements over the last 25 years uh, along with the oil industry. It is now part of their DNA. I've had the good fortune to go visit uh, several airlines and see their operations and how they conduct themselves in accordance with the safety management system frameworks. And it is remarkable. It is not a program. It's part of their DNA. And when you talk to the safety experts in this country, what they'll tell you is that companies fall into three buckets. They fall into the yo-yo bucket, the yo-yo bucket, you know what that is. Let's get a program together. Let's get a team together. Let's put some posters up. Let's move the ball for a year or two. And what do we do? We slide back uh, on that chart, Craig, that you pointed out. Because it's hard to keep that going as a program. The second bucket is really the best practices, the management, the risk management oriented companies. They benchmark themselves. They continue to be better than their peers, but they've stalled out, right? They've stalled out. Many of the companies that you represent here in the room uh, and, uh, and across the country on this webcast, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where well, you've bottomed out in a variety of areas and you're scratching your head as to how we're going to break through and get better. And then finally, there's the best in class companies. They consistently, significantly outperform their peers. And what element do they share? That the culture of safety starts from the top management and is completely embedded into their organizations. It starts from the top and is completely embedded into their organizations. Now, why is this important? This is important because the average life of a C-suite executive is less than five years. In our industry, we have an aging workforce. All those people that you indoctrinated into your safety culture, they're going to be retiring in the next five years. You're going to be bringing a new cadre of people. The next acquisition that you make, you might have a great safety culture, but are the new people going to be embraced? If it's part of your DNA, you have a higher chance to succeed. You know, we really, uh, this is what I think uh, uh, the academics call a wicked problem. In Boston, we call it wicked hard, right? <clears throat> but I think in academia, it's, it's, it's wicked hard to really solve this problem effectively over, over a long period of time. And that's why we all came together to create structure, to create a framework. You go around, you talk to companies, well, we're doing this. Yeah, but, but explain it to me. What are you doing and how are you doing it? And some companies like Marathon and Spectre and Kinder Morgan, you know, they have their programs that they can point to and they're trying to make better. And companies like those probably will see incremental improvement as they imply, apply the safety management system. Hopefully there are other companies out there that will make order of magnitude change over time, and still others that will try to make 
transformational changes to their business, right? But to me, the way I've, I've always led organizations, it's a lot simpler to start from a playbook. You know, uh, we heard Vince Lombardi uh, remembered here today. Well, Vince Lombardi had a playbook. You know, we just didn't draw it on the sand uh, in the huddle, hoping that they would be able to get their play, right? We can't do like Justice Potter Stewart said about pornography, you know, I can't define it, but I'll know it when I see it, right? We have to have a better answer than that for how we're going to operate safely within our companies. And this safety management system, I think, provides the beginning of where we want our industry to go. Remember at the last PHMSA workshop, when the chemical industry got up here and they talked about how 25 years ago they embarked on doing just this and how there was a great deal of uncomfortableness amongst the industry and the companies it represented, right? Several companies left the association because they didn't want to be part of a program that started to talk about independent assessments. Now, all of the member companies go through complete independent assessments of elements that they keep adding to the program. This is where I hope we take this. I hope this is just the beginning, Jeff, of where we ultimately want to go. But we can't boil the ocean. We've got to start somewhere. And this is a great start. Uh, I've seen great passion uh, led by Ron, who's done an amazing job bringing us all together uh, and creating a document that I hope that we can all rally and get our heads around. You know, I take great pride in the changes we've been able to make at PG&E uh, over the last three years. And I don't think we could have done it without the framework of PASS 55, ISO 55,000. Uh, we uh, set a goal for ourselves two years ago that we wanted to be certified under PASS 55, ISO 55001 on July 4th of this year. We wanted that to be our Independence Day. And when we had an initial assessment made two years ago against the 28 elements of PASS 55, 24 of them we had significant deficiency, 24. You can't have one significant deficiency and be certified under those two um, asset management standards. Well, I'm pleased to report that last month we achieved uh, certification of both PASS, both PASS 55 and ISO 55001. I think we're one of the first uh, gas companies in the world to hold both of those certifications. Many of the principles that we talk about in API 1173 uh, are in those two documents, but the area that they don't cover is safety culture. And I think that this committee has done such great work to embed safety culture principles throughout this document because to me, that's what brings this, this to life. That's what I see in the airline industry. That's what I see in the chemical industry, that it's that emotional element that they've been able to create that drives this continual effort to get to zero. So at PG&E, what has that meant? How do we embrace and get people emotionally tied into what we're trying to do? The first thing we did is that we encouraged all of our folks from the lowest person in the organization on up to be able to report and self-identify issues into our corrective action program that we borrowed liberally from our Diablo nuclear power plant. We put in place a non-punitive self-reporting system so that anybody can report without fear or concern uh, of their own uh, well-being. We've built a repeatable process where we go in and prioritize, risk rank, every issue that gets reported. We let the individual know who reported it, that we received your report. Here, who we, how we've categorized it. Here's who we've assigned it to. And by the way, when we close it out, you get a communication back that it's done. This builds confidence uh, within your people that you have a do-say ratio equal to one that you do what you say you're going to do. You want them to identify problems and you follow up. 
you ensure um, that we have a mechanism to, um, to resolve these issues. So it's not just that we, that we identify them, but we actually figure out how to get them dealt with in a complete and sustaining way. And finally, to instill the idea that when problems get identified, they're our problems, not your problems, right? We talked about, uh, in several of the presentations today, of not going first to blaming the employee, as Chairman Hart spoke about, right? But as a company, what can we do better? How can we operate better? And I think that's the spirit um, within which we created the safety management system. And it's the spirit within which I hope you will read it. Uh, I hope you will uh, embrace it. And I hope you will provide substantive and meaningful comments uh, that will help us make this an even better document in its final form. Thank you very much. Tell a quick story on Nick, and then we'll, we'll go to break. Um, I, I was really quite impressed by the, the non-punitive reporting thing is one of the aspects we've talked about at length within the committee, and I think it takes a little while of talking about that and thinking about it before you start owning it and what the value is to engage employees in there. But I do recall Nick's story. Actually, I think he called me one day to tell me the story. It was They had found an issue in the company and decided to self-report it. Um, to the regulator. The regulator turned around, gave them a whopping pot, uh, fine, right? And it was public information, so the employees would have seen that. But I do recall, and I, I commend Nick for saying, uh, sending a note out to his employees and say, that's okay. Um, you know, if I don't know about it, we can't fix it, right? So just so keep them coming. You know, and I think that, that's a testament, you know, I think to the leadership there, but it's also a good segue into the safety culture. Many people on the committee have been really strong proponents of safety culture. I do think it's one of the things that differentiates this document from some of the other safety management system approaches I've seen. Um, and I will tell you, that was back and forth and back and forth. And I'll, uh, my, my last uh, story on that one, but I think it was quite telling about the committee was, a well-intentioned individual who had been hearing all this comment about, well, it's, there's too much uh, what, why in there, let's simplify this, did a rewrite, voluntary rewrite of the document to try to help, honestly, but the committee recoiled you know, at that. They had moved all the safety culture stuff out to the back. The whole committee recoiled at that. It took us probably 10 or 15 minutes and that was done. We were back to where we were. So, you know, I think as you wrestle with that, because we did, we, you know, it was in, it was out, it was a separate chapter, then it was in the back. You know, I would just tell you that we wrestled with it ourselves. So I suspect that if you haven't thought about that, it will take a little while to resonate. Um, but I think it was the right, right choice, and I think the committee was quite wise in doing that. The only other thing I want to say on this one is somebody did the did the URL get? Pardon? It is. Okay, and in some slide at some point in time, I'll provide the NEB safety culture uh, link to that. So for anybody on the webcast, for it, by the way, there's roughly 200 people on the webcast. So I, I think it proves the, the value of trying to engage people and save costs for them. It's better to be here so you can talk to people in the hall and go out to Thai restaurants with them, but nonetheless. I, I'll also say to that point is you, you heard two of our executives and probably more, you know, operate in more than one regulatory environment. Right? But we've had about a 10 year partnership with the Canadian National Energy Board um, and probably five years with the Mexican CRE. Um, Mexico is changing radically now if you, in the energy front if you haven't been following that. But that group is emerging as really the lead for pipeline, the Mexican CRE. So I think that's been time well spent, I think, to Andy's point really, harmonization of these regimes, the pipeline doesn't know when it crosses a boundary you know, uh, makes good sense, um, and uh, they've, they've done good work up there, but I think they've also learned. I remember 10 years ago when they were taking integrity management from us, you know, and so I think we go back and forth. I think we're, we're exchanging ideas, and good ideas always win in the end of the day. So I think with that, I want, if you'll join me, I want to thank these gentlemen for taking time to share their stories with us. Thank you.
Let me just double check the time really quickly. We hit right on time. I'm telling you, we are good. We are good. Okay, it's 3 o'clock. Why don't we take a 20-minute uh, break? We'll be back at 3.20 Eastern Time. At that point, we'll bring all the members of the committee who are here. I'd appreciate it if you would come up, and we'll do open Q&A. So if you're thinking about this on the webcast or here, feel free to capture any questions, and we're happy to swing at anything. Thank you.